Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Kindle, Android, or MP3 player. Hi, I'm Stephanie Craig. Welcome to the History Fangirl Podcast. This is episode 17, Banqueting House, The Place to Kill a King. Visiting London, one can get overwhelmed with the number of historic places that are must-see. You have to hit Westminster Abbey, the Tower of London, and St. Paul's Cathedral, but then you're just barely scratching the surface. Today, my guest is Leanda Delisle, the New York Times bestselling author. Her latest book is The White King, Charles I, Traitor, Murderer, Martyr. I invited her on the show today to share about one of her favorite places in London to celebrate and learn about the legacy of the Stuarts, Banqueting House. We chat about its famous architect, Inigo Jones, its grandeur, including a ceiling by Peter Paul Rubens, and the most infamous event to happen at Banqueting House, the execution of Charles I. All right, my guest today is Leanda Delisle. She is the author of the new book, The White King, which is a fantastic biography of Charles I, traitor, murderer, martyr. Um, You may also know her from some of her previous work, Tudor, The Family Story. I know her best from The Sisters Who Would Be Queen, which is a wonderful book. If you love the story of Lady Jane Grey and her very interesting sisters, you should check out that one. And today we're going to be talking about Banqueting House, in London. Hi, Landa. Hello. So Banqueting House is a very interesting place. It's right in the middle of a lot of maybe not more important, but maybe better known places. It's kind of right down where most tourists go, but it's pretty easy to overlook if you don't know what you're looking for. So why don't you tell us about Banqueting House? Well, it was built by Charles's father, uh, James the First, um, who needed somewhere really to kind of show off to foreign ambassadors and where they could entertain and have sort of grand masks, which were a sort of form of cross between theatre, ballet and a ball uh, that they used to do as a sort of form of court entertainment. And he needed a big grand building to do that. So he commissioned Inigo Jones, who uh, was an English architect who had uh, Um, had fallen in love with Italy and Italian architecture, particularly the architecture of Palladio, to build a banqueting house. And this was 1619, when Charles I was already 19 years old, and uh, he would become King of England only a few years later in 1625. Now, James had this one commissioned because he did not like his previous banqueting house, and I believe it burned down. What were the upgrades that he was looking for with the new one? Well, I think he wanted something that was going to impress uh, European visitors, uh, which this did. It was really kind of the first building in England that most English people had seen built in the Italian Palladian style with you know, this incredible stone front, which actually looked very different then than it does today because it was originally built in two different colours of um, uh, yellowish stone plus these uh, sort of grey stone pilasters. And unfortunately, in the 19th century, the whole thing was refaced Oh. grey stones so you, oh. you can't see how colourful it would have been then which is a pity <laughs> and Charles wanted to um, build the whole of Whitehall Palace in the same kind of style and use the same architect uh, but unfortunately he was uh, never able to afford uh, to do that but he did manage to commission uh, this incredible ceiling which is still there by Rubens and which is the it's the biggest single sort of painted, um, you know, canvas ceiling in Northern Europe. And in fact, the biggest in Europe outside uh, Venice. So in your book, you talk about when Marie de Medici has her portraits painted. By, and that was by Rubens, correct? Yes. Yeah, so she has all these incredible, the Rubens cycle, which is these incredible, I think it's 12 or 14. I can't remember now, 12 or 14 full length, or even bigger than full length portraits of herself. 
with her as regent of France and her you know, delivering her son, who's to be king of France, uh, and all these amazing portraits really just saying, look at me, I'm marvellous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> was that Charles's and James's introduction to Rubens? Was that through the French court? Yes, I think it probably would have been through the French court that he would first have come across Rubens, and then he would have seen see more of him at the Spanish court when he arrived in, in Madrid. Um, he would have seen Rubens there. And then, of course, Rubens actually came to England as a diplomat uh, in 1629. Uh, so Charles spent some time with him then, too. Oh, wow. I have a hard time sometimes in my head placing artists and monarchs. And so I don't think I realized Rubens was a Stuart contemporary. Yes, yes, he, uh, yes, absolutely, he was. Um, and um, and he, he sort of doubled as a diplomat as well as an artist. So he was a really very significant figure. Now, Inigo Jones is also a pretty significant figure in English architecture. What are some other places that listeners might be familiar with him, his work from? Well, he built the Queen's House um, in Greenwich. They may well be familiar with that. So in your book, you cover a little bit of the relationship between James and Charles, which was an interesting one. And this building was built when Charles was uh, in his late teens. What was home life like for the Stuarts? Yes, well, that's an interesting question. Well, at that particular time, Charles's mother died that year, 1619. His elder brother had died uh, when he was 12. With, in fact, Charles was held his brother was holding his brother's hand, you know, when he when he died, allowing Charles was then you know, to become the heir to the throne. Um, and his sister had travelled abroad to be married, so Charles was sort of left on his own, really. In England, um, and with the death of his mother, it was just him and his father. But his father uh, was very much in love, really, with his favourite, the Duke of Buckingham. And although clearly we don't know exactly what went on in the bedroom, it does seem to have been essentially a homosexual relationship. Um, and that, I think, was quite difficult for Charles when he was younger, but he sort of came to terms with it by the time he was 19. And uh, the Duke of Buckingham spent quite a lot of time sucking up to Charles as the heir to the throne from that stage. <laughs> so just so listeners are aware, I received a copy of the book, but then I actually went and purchased another one because I wanted the audio version because the book is so good. I wanted to listen to it. Um, my favorite history I always listen to. So I have listened to it a couple of times and it's just, I did not appreciate the Stuarts, even listening to really great podcasts like Rex Factor, which go through the history of like every king or studying. I feel like this book is the first one that's made them seem like people to me and not historical figures in the way that the Tudors really are people in my head at this point. And that relationship between Charles and Buckingham, you do a really good job of giving them their own, like you see them as two independent people with a relationship on their own and they travel together. Uh, and so I guess just go more into, you know, after Buckingham is sucking up to Charles, what is their relationship like? Yes, it's very interesting. I mean, he becomes a sort of mentor to Charles. This is a young man on his own who's going to be king one day and, and Buckingham gives him a sort of hand up into adult life, really. Uh, so, you know, Charles can confide in Buckingham about his girlfriends. And, you know, if he quarrels with his father, then, you know, Buckingham helps sort it out and smooth things over. And then uh, when Charles starts having his own kind of political ideas, then Buckingham supports him and supports him against the king so that Charles really sees him as a, as a, as a, a friend and someone he can really trust and rely on. And so by the time his father dies, he really sees Buckingham as his closest friend. And he's this sort of cross between a kind of parent figure, um, a brother, an elder brother, and, and a friend. He's of all these things rolled into one, really. How old is Buckingham compared to Charles? Uh, he's not much older. Um, but of course, when you're sort of 19, and the other one is in his sort of mid-20s, it is quite a gap. I mean, if Buckingham had lived another 20 or 30 years, the gap wouldn't have seemed so big. But at that stage you know, is, is quite a gap. You know, one's an adult and one's, one was a boy and one was an adult, really. So Big Queen House is the scene of one of the most infamous events in English history, which is Charles I was executed out front of it. And if you think about the reign of Charles I between his father commissioning it and him being, you know, a prince who would be king to his execution, it's, it's hard to really appreciate what that arc is. Can you just explain a little bit about 
what happened during the reign of Charles I that leads him from being this promising prince to an executed monarch? Well, I think it all, the, the backdrop to Charles's reign is this war, tremendous war in Europe, the Thirty Years' War, which is between uh, the Catholic Habsburgs and uh, various Protestant powers, although they're also joined by France later. And it's seen in England very much as a war between Catholicism and Protestantism, which Protestantism is losing. Uh, and that makes some um, uh, many um, Protestants in England feel very insecure. And so when Charles starts reforming the Church of England on sort of quite conservative lines, so the Church of England was a, essentially a Calvinist church, a very kind of, sort of low church form of Protestantism, a very stripped back version of Protestantism. And he, he likes beauty and ritual, and he sort of encourages this aspect of the Church of England, which, um, although Protestant, uh, is, is a much more... Is much nearer to Catholicism than Calvinism. Uh, and uh, I think this made some people very fearful of what Charles's intentions were. And that was one aspect of, of, of opposition to Charles that started building up. And then the other aspect was that partly because of mistrust, his relationship with his parliaments broke down. And there was a fear uh, from some quarters that he was going to rule permanently without parliament. And um, in the end, it ended up in the country split in the civil war between those who supported Charles I and those who supported uh, the opposition to him in Parliament. What was the trial like? Um, oh, that was an extraordinary event, really, to put a King of England on trial, because technically treason in England could only be committed against a king. So you couldn't try a king for treason. His uh, enemies redefined treason to be a treason against the state, really, against the people. Uh, and uh, so he was, he was tried as an enemy of the people, uh, as a murderer and traitor. And in the end, uh, he was convicted. I mean, he put up an extraordinary uh, defence. Uh, and there were people, even the wives of leading parliamentary generals who were sort of shouting out during the trial that, um, it was a dis that the trial was a disgrace and that they didn't support it. Uh, but he was uh, found guilty and uh, condemned to death at the end of the trial. What were the last days of Charles I like? Very tragic, really. Uh, he was brought first uh, to Whitehall after the trial, where the scaffold was being built outside a banqueting house. Uh, and then he was moved, perhaps to spare him the sound of the scaffold being built, to St. James's Palace, where he spent the next few days. Uh, he had his, his last ever meeting with uh, two of his children, which was a very sort of tragic scene uh, with his daughter, who was uh, just a, in her early teens, you know, sobbing, and his um, very small son, who was, um, gosh, I can't remember, kind of five years old or something, sitting on his lap and him explaining to this little boy that he was going to have his, his head cut off um, and that his enemies might try and make him king uh, in place of his elder brothers and that he mustn't, he mustn't accept that. And the little boy is saying that he'd be torn in pieces uh, before he would agree to such a thing. It was, it's a, a terribly sad scene, and Charles giving giving him uh, giving these children his last sort of pathetic possessions, which are are in fact eventually confiscated from these children to be sold, and then you have his sort of you know his prayers and things before his last prayers before he he leaves St James's Palace and is taken through the park uh, back to Whitehall and indeed into the banqueting house. Um, where he um, he's walked through the banqueting house, which is this long room uh, lined on either side by you know by a crowd, and he's then taken through a window, which has been sort of removed, uh, to step directly onto the scaffold, which is like a sort of theatre, really, a sort of theatre of death. I've seen many depictions of executions from the Tudor age and there's a lot of talk about like you know the speeches that people will give and you know they always say good things about the king but this is such a different situation where you have a king being executed what was the actual like what what were his words what did the crowd feel well it was very interesting because usually execution state executions like this would were held you know, on tower hill which was a big area and you'd have huge crowds on on stands essentially on sort of scaffolded stands to witness the death uh, but in this case the bank the area outside the banqueting house was chosen because it was a very small confined area so that not many people would be able to witness 
Charles's death. And the crowd was, such as it was, was held well back. So when Charles got onto the scaffold and he looked around to give his speech, he realised that very few people would hear it. And in fact, the only people who would hear it would be the people who were actually standing on the scaffold uh, with him. But he, he knew, nevertheless, that it would be, of course, repeated and reported. He said, essentially, that um, he was dying as a martyr uh, for the people and that, you know, that he was being killed illegally and that he was dying for the law. Uh, he was dying uh, for the Church of England and for his um, and for his people. What happens to Banqueting House after his execution? It's become to be used by the you know the new the new powers are who are the army essentially the new model army which is eventually you know taken over. We have a protector in in Oliver Cromwell who's general of the new model army and Whitehall becomes his palace and uh, Oliver Cromwell becomes a kind of king and his. His, his daughters are called princesses, and it's a sort of semi-royal setup, really. So it becomes from being used, used by the Stuarts, the royal Stuarts, it comes to be used by Oliver Cromwell. After the Restoration, do Charles's children use Banqueting House again, or is it tainted? No, no, yes. No, Charles II um, uh, would definitely uh, use it. Not all, of course. Charles's children survived. Um, uh, his the, the da- young daughter he had said goodbye to on the last days of his life. Uh, she she died in um, Carisbrook Castle on the Isle of Wight, where Charles had been imprisoned when she was still I think she was fourteen when she died. And um, at least two two of his other children I think had you know, died by then by the, by the Restoration as well. Or they died actually in the same months as the Restoration, same year as the Restoration. So they weren't in this smallpox, I think. Uh, so they weren't able to enjoy it. But um, yes, yeah, those who lived were able to, of course. And his eldest son became Charles II. What happened to Whitehall at the end of the 17th century? Because it does no, not survive. No, it, it, um, it burned down. Um, I don't know if it was a huge loss in a way. It had been described by one Frenchman as the largest and ugliest palace in Europe by that stage. <laughs> it was really a sort of series of endless little buildings and houses um, dating from slightly different periods. But um, the original Whitehall had been built by Cardinal Wolsey under Henry VIII. Um, and there have been lots of sort of add-ons since then. And um, I think they're probably all quite... I mean, Charles I was desperate to get rid of it. Even when he was a prisoner um, of Parliament, he was, still, he was still working with Inigo Jones on you know, the great palace that they were going to build next to the banqueting house that would sort of match it in style and beauty. But, um, but of course, never was built. And it seems extraordinary that he was still making these plans, actually, while he was a prisoner, but he did. It's always interesting when you learn, like, what a monarch is, is working on after they've been captured. Like, uh, I, I listened to an interview recently about, you know, what the, what the Tsar and Tsarina were focused on in their final days. Yes, and how distant, in a way, they can be from reality. I suppose Charles obviously still believed that, you know, it could all work out. He believed that he might be able to come to some kind of arrangement with Parliament right up until the last day of his trial. He hoped that the trial was essentially a kind of bluff and that, if he held out for long enough, they would give way. And I think he was astonished when they, when in fact they, they did not, far from giving way, they said that, you know, no, we're going to cut off your head. What are some highlights of Banqueting House in maybe the 18th, 19th, 20th century? During Charles's reign, it was used, particularly in the early 1630s, it was used for these amazing masks, which were a particular feature of the reign, which Henrietta, his wife, Henrietta Maria, would perform uh, with her ladies. And this sort of aroused fury of the Puritans who did not approve of women standing on stage uh, and speaking, and even worse, uh, dressing up in male costume, which they thought was uh, wicked and against the Bible, and that it um, was a way of women trying to steal uh, men's roles, really, the male role by speaking in public, and um, even worse, you know, wearing trousers. Oh, wow. Let's talk about the book because, like I said, I've I've listened to I read it and I listened to it a couple of times. It's really good, and it's I know there are other bi- biographies about Stuart monarchs, but this one really I think this is the first time. Even listening to like Mike Duncan's Revolutions podcast about uh, the English Revolution, this was the first time I really felt like Charles was a person to me and not a symbol, figure, accident. But he was like a, he was a you know a full person with a real personality. And how did you decide to write this book? 
funny enough, one of my first history books that I really enjoyed were C.B. Wedgwood's um, books on Charles I. He wrote, she wrote um, three, I think she wrote The King's Peace, then The King's War, and then The King's Trial. And they were all about Charles I. And they were fantastic books, and I really enjoyed them. So I, I, I was looking forward one day to doing a book on, on Charles. And I was aware that, you know, that he has kind of fallen out of fashion, his reign, and people weren't really interested in him. Um, and I think it's because people's impression of him has been so negative and it's all he's remembered entirely right this is a man who has his head chopped off at the end of his reign he's a failed king and he's seen entirely in this in this light rather than as a living a changing human being who has successes who has failures and whose reign is incredibly exciting and dramatic and full of interesting people and and amongst these people are many fascinating women who I think people are sort of unaware of. And uh, one of the great appeals of the Tudor period are these incredible queens and other women. Uh, and um, I thought it'd be good for people to know as well, not only that Charles was a fascinating and a very sort of brave and principled man, who had many virtues as, many, as well as failings, but that he was married to a, an incredible and fascinating woman in Henrietta Maria. Yeah, I, so I am the kind of person who, when I was in high school, I knew all the queens and kings of England in order because I was a nerd and I loved it, but I did competitive trivia. And so I don't think Henrietta Maria has ever entered my head as a person either. Like, just so listeners are aware, one of the quotes on your website, which is something that I I read after reading some of your books that just know to be completely true, is the creator of Down Abbey said, that you have a gift of reminding us that history is the story of real people. And I, I really, there are people in this book who are only characters that are now people in my head. And Henrietta Maria is one of them. Her mother is Marie de' Medici. I could not think of a woman in European history that is more notorious than Marie de' Medici. And yet her daughter was always a blank slate in my head. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Henrietta Maria? Because she was incredibly interesting yes well she arrives in england um as a bride aged only 15 and you know it's extremely difficult time because uh she's a she's a a catholic princess uh, and just for that reason alone she she has a lot of enemies enemies in england and buckingham makes trouble really in her marriage with charles uh, for his own political reasons Uh, but she does manage she manages to turn this round she manages to turn around her marriage she's very involved in politics. When later on, when the Civil War comes along, she's an extremely supportive uh, wife to her husband. Uh, she goes to Europe. She acts as his diplomat, his arms buyer. She brings back arms from Europe and soldiers to England, is sort of hunted through the high seas by Parliament and escapes them. You know, she's under shell fire in England, um, but people being killed all around her in battle. I mean, you don't have queens really living like this. You don't have queens on the whole being shelled and having to hide in ditches with people being blown to pieces a few yards from them. But this happens to Henrietta Maria, and she hand- handles it all with aplomb. Uh, she you know, leads armies during the Civil War, and she's really just a very uh, brave and um, remarkable woman. Um, and very passionate. She's got a really very strong voice that you hear in her in her letters, which I enjoy as well. And uh, and I think I think what else I, I find in, interesting about her is the way that she's attacked and how she's attacked. And she's attacked in, in ways that are very similar, I think, to women in politics now. Any decision her husband makes, she's if it's a wrong decision, she is mysteriously supposed to be behind it. And she's sort of presented as this kind of Eve to Charles's Adam, you know, seducing him, leading him astray. Um, and it's just quite interesting to see how these old sexist tropes you know, can, you know, were used then and, and continue now often as well. What is life like for her during his trial? Well, it must be very hard. She's in exile in France at that stage. Uh, and she writes to people in Parliament asking, can she come to England to be with her husband to support him? But um, they won't let her. There, there, there's actually sort of riots and things going on in France at the same time. And the French royal family actually flee Paris. And she's left behind in the Palace of the Louvre uh, with no money and, and no heating for, to keep her warm or her small. She's got a, she's got a young child with her. Um, but um, she, but she, she stays there and she's actually in the Louvre when she's eventually told that her husband has been executed in a very sort of tragic scene where she's sort of 
collapse. She just she's told during dinner and she just sort of sits there for hours. She can't move. She's so sort of traumatized by what she hears. It was a very sort of loving marriage at the end. What was her legacy like in France? Well, she was greatly respected um, by her nephew, Louis XIV, the Sun King, who uh, was very fond of his aunt. And when she when she dies, he he get, you know he pays for a state state funeral for her. And of course, one of the one of the funny things I did find out about because she wasn't known as Henrietta Maria in England. Um, she was she was known as Queen Mary, um, funny enough, um, and that hence Maryland. Maryland was named after her. And uh, one oh. of the things I didn't know is that very briefly uh, they experimented with calling her Queen Henry because she's Henrietta Hen- Ori after her father Ori. So you could have had instead of Maryland, you could have had Henryland. <laughs> I think Maryland is a much better name. Henry Land would be quite odd. Queen <laughs> Henry would have been quite intriguing. Queen Henry. Yeah, that would have been that would have been very interesting. So the Tudors are so popular, and I think that you know the Plantagenets are getting more popular. Richard the Third is definitely popular. What is it like to be a champion of the Stuarts in this kind of Tudor moment? Well, I mean, because you know, I as you know, I've written several books on the Tudors, and you know, I love the Tudor period, but the drama of the Tudor period doesn't end with the death of Elizabeth. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, it reaches resolution, really, during the reign of um, Charles I. And apart from Charles and Henrietta Maria, the way I tell this story is through um, these cousins, really, who are all related to Elizabeth I's last favourite, uh, the Earl of Essex. And it is very much a kind of, sort of late Elizabethan story that's finishing here during the reign of Charles I, actually, I find. And they are all descendants, these cousins uh, that I write about, um, the Earl of Holland, Lucy, Countess of Carlisle, um, and uh, Robert Rich, Earl of Warwick, after whom Warwick County, for example, is named. Lots of places in the United States are named after him. Uh, They're all descendants of uh, Mary Boleyn, Anne Boleyn's sister, um, the other Boleyn girl. (laughs) And, and I, I think I call Lucy Carlyle the last Boleyn girl. She is very much a Boleyn, I think, Lucy Carlyle. I did not, I had not heard of her before. Is she is Yes, yeah, she's a sort of frenemy from hell. She's a, she starts off as uh, the lover of um, the Duke of Buckingham. And uh, Buckingham wants to impose her on, on the Queen's household. And, and he hopes maybe that she's going to be uh, Charles's mistress. And uh, she doesn't become Charles's mistress, but she does become uh, Henrietta Maria's sort of best friend. But then she turns coat in the civil war, the outbreak of the civil war and she she's on parliament side and then during at the end of the first civil war she sort of changes again and she becomes a royalist again and ends up in the tower actually um having sort of taken part in the royalist um, rebellion and i won't say how she dies but she does die very sort of dramatically um just at the time of the restoration <laughs> what's one thing that surprised you about charles the first that you learned researching this book Gosh, I suppose I felt that I hadn't really known him before. So I discovered so many things about him, really. Um, What a sort of romantic figure he was. Um, He had sort of great, he had very sort of noble aspirations, I think, uh, Charles. He he really wanted to be a good man as well as a good king. It was, it's very interesting to see someone struggle with that sometimes succeed and sometimes sometimes fail. And the tragedy of the failure, actually, the tragedy of doing everything he possibly could to be the best king that he could be, the best man that he could be, and then to end up the way he did um, on a scaffold, being reviled by some as a traitor and murderer is, is quite, quite extraordinary, really. So I want to ask you a couple of questions just because I'm personally curious. You are a TV historian, too, or you do work in on television productions. What is that like, and how is it different than when you're writing books? Well, I love I love television actually. I love I, and I think television and indeed fiction does wonderful things for um, people's interest in history. Um, I think a lot of people begin uh, their love of history with having watched you know, Anne of a Thousand Days or some other great film or TV series um, can bring them to history. Uh, so I think it's a very positive positive thing. So it, it differs. It differs in, in, on, on, on the focus. You can only look at brief little snippets, and it's about telling a story in sort of picture images, isn't it? Really, rather than going into the detail and the kind of richness you can you can do in a, in a book. It's just a different way of telling a story. You have to fill in the blanks much more when you're watching television with your imagination. 
when you work on a TV production, what kinds of things are you doing day to day? Well, I mean, I, I work just in sort of, you know, I tend to do documentaries rather than rather than drama. I mean, I'm actually going to be interviewed um, later this later this week. I mean, and it's it's fairly straightforward. You know, I just um, I'll, I'll turn up and um, they'll ask me lots of questions and <laughs> film me fill me answering them. It's it's you know, it's it's um, it's it's fairly straightforward. That sounds fascinating. If somebody is an aspiring historian out in the world, and maybe they're saying they're like 19, 20, and they're trying to decide if this is what they want to do for a living, what's some advice you would give them? Funnily enough, I didn't, I didn't even know the historian Dan Jones. Oh, yeah, I love his show. I mean, I don't personally know him. If he wants to come on the show, he's more than welcome. <laughs> oh, yes, you should have him one day. He's very, very, he's just written a book on the Templars. Um, and uh, anyway, he's he he's 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 much young, he's much younger than I am. I met him when he was just graduated from Cambridge, and he got a sort of first class degree. Um, and I said, well, you know, he, I knew he was interested in history, and I said, well, I can I can help you in this because you know I think you'd be a fantastic historian. But I said to him, you know, it's not an easy way to earn a living. You know, it's much easier. I, I was thinking that you know, he could be a sort of a lawyer, or he could be, you know, he could have been a million and one one thing. So it might be an easier way to earn a living than um, being a historian. But I don't think that he's ever regretted it. I think, you know, he, he really, it's a, it's a kind of, it's work that, work that he loves. Um, and how to begin, gosh, well, I think, you know, you've just got to, you've just got to, you've just got to get, you just got to get, I think with all writing, you've just got to get stuck in there, actually. You've got to, you just got to sit down and start writing. That's what you have to do. And it can take practice. It can take a little while to find your voice and also to find your subject but it's just, I think like everything in life, it's about doing. And don't let anyone ever tell you you can't do this or you can't do that. Because that usually means they can't do it. <laughs> <Doesn't>... Agreed. <laughs> well, Landa, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm really excited for everyone to learn about Banqueting House and hopefully to crack open your book and really get to know Charles I because I highly recommend it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I want to say thank you again to Leanda for coming on the show. I can wholeheartedly recommend picking up or downloading a copy of The White King. If you end up checking out Banqueting House on a future trip to London, please drop me a line and let me know about your trip. Email me at stephanie at historyfangirl.com or find me on our Facebook page or Instagram. Just let me know how your trip goes. Some show updates. If you are enjoying the show and want to help by supporting the production costs, there are three great ways that you can do it. Uh, the first is you can head over to the website. Over the weekend, I launched a site shop. And right now there are two shirts. One is about Roman history and one is about Greek history. And they are both available on historyfangirl.com in the shop. And both t-shirts come as a unisex tee and also as a women's tank, which I think are super cute. The second way is by becoming a patron on Patreon. The link to my Patreon account is in the show notes. And then three, you can rate and review the show on iTunes. That will never fail to be a great way to support the show. Thanks for listening.